Uh, hello again, I'm Gilay, and the paper that I'll present today has this long name on the screen, using Boolean functions of context factors for adaptive mental model aggregation in organizational learning. This is our second paper with Jan Trur, and uh, in the beginning, I will explain uh, some common things as in the previous slide uh, presentation. It will be like a memory refresher for those who listened to the uh, previous one. Uh, when we talk about mental models, three concepts uh, come to our minds. Usage, adaptation, and control. Having knowledge uh, or even having only an image of a thing or a task or an abstract concept is the usage of mental models. We have the inner representations of the outer world uh, in our minds. And adapting these representations means gaining or losing knowledge on them. Uh, learning is the strength, strengthening the connections of the mental models and forgetting is the weakening them. And of course, we have the ability to control this adaptation, for instance, by uh, doing mental exercises. Uh, controlling is mainly about the speed and persistence uh, of the learning and forgetting. On the other hand, organizational learning is uh, an interesting process of unification of individual mental models. These four uh, are, not the, are not strictly separated states, but we can consider organizational learning uh, as a process that consists of four different phases to see the change and the progress easily. First one is individual learning of uh, peer persons. Uh, here, per, p, individuals improve their mental models. And the second one is formation of shared organization mental model. Uh, here, individuals create, they create their shared mental model. It's called feed-forward learning. And uh, in phase three, uh, individuals start to learn from their shared mental model. It's uh, a feedback learning from organization to individuals and it's called instructional learning. And the last one, the last phase is the improvements of individuals uh, with the help of, help of their learning from their sh shared mental model. And uh, the main focus of this paper is the Boolean functions uh, used to control aggregation of the individuals in this uh, second phase. Uh, we use different functions and context states, uh, but I'll talk about in detail them uh, later. This is the cognitive architecture uh, for mental models, and we have uh, equivalent layers for this cognitive architecture. The left ones uh, are the co cognitive architecture layers, and the right ones are the uh, self-modeling network layers. For usage, uh, for internal simulation, we have base level, for adaptation, we have first order self model level, and for control of adaptation, we have second order self model level. Uh, this is the um, self model network, self uh, modeling network for feed forward learning. Uh, in this base level, we have uh, mental models for per individuals. These are for person B, and these are for person A. And also we have uh, base level uh, mental models for organization that didn't exist in the beginning. For, these, uh, for all these connections, we have double states representing the weight of the connection. For example, for this connection from A to B, uh, for person B, we have this uh, double state. We have uh, three different double states for each person and also the organization. And also we have uh, connections from W states to W states to uh, make organizational learning possible, these connections. And also we have uh, for feedback learning, uh, the opposite connections. We have the opposite connections from organization to individuals. Uh, it's needed, these are needed uh, to make persons, individuals uh, able to learn from their shared mental model. And as I said, uh, we have four different phases. Therefore, we have four different context states here. These are like the these context states are like the switch between uh, the phases. 
Uh, as I said, the base level is here, and uh, this is like the core of our model. And in this first order self-model level, we have W states, and we have also uh, these context factors. These are needed uh, to determine the context, the case, uh, because our model is context sensitive, it's depend on the context. Uh, we have a lot of context states. And also in the second order self-model level, we have aggregation control states, these C states. And also we have uh, H states for speed factor, M states for learning persistence, higher order W states for the W to W connections here, feedback and feed forward, forward learning. Uh, these C states are here to make the uh, aggregation of individual mental models adaptive. The aggregation part takes place uh, with the help of the combination function. Therefore, these C states represent different combination functions. We have four different combination functions, logistic sum, scaled maximum, Euclidean, and scaled geometric mean. And we have three kinds of uh, connections, these A to B, B to C, and C to D. Therefore, three times four, we have uh, 12 C states in total. And also, uh, as I mentioned, we have context states uh, to, determine, to determine the choice of the combination function. We have a context state for knowledgeability, for dependency, and for the preference for type of quantity. For example, uh, if the case will be the following, uh, A and B are both experienced, they are dependent on each other, and their preference uh, is additive. If this is the case, the function will be Euclidean, will be selected as Euclidean. Uh, when we use zeros and ones to see the things clearly, uh, we got this table. And if this, if this table uh, is carefully examined, we can extract uh, Boolean propositions for these functions, as you can see in the next slide. For example, for C1, for the state C1, uh, representing logistic function, this is the Boolean proposition. It says uh, if A is experienced and B is experienced and they are not dependent on each other, the function will be logistic. When we look at this table, we can see that this is correct. Uh, A and B both experienced, they are not dependent, then the function is logistic. The other uh, Boolean propositions for the other functions are there. And to get rid of uh, this negotiation uh, not uh, notion, we just created the opposite of these uh, states, these context states. For experienced states, we have beginner states. For dependent states, we have independent states. And for additive preference, we have also multiplicator preference. And this is the uh, final version of our uh, Boolean propositions for functions. And of course, uh, we need connections from these context states to C states, because context states deter determines the case and affects the C states. The combination function is selected, selected according to the case itself. And required connections, we can see the required connections in this table easily. These are the context states, these are the C states. And for example, again, for logistic function uh, for C1, we need connection from experienced A, experienced B, and independent AB. We have double uh, plus uh, for preference states, because when we look at the uh, propositions, we can see that we just used them twice. And here, uh, the order is also important. We should keep the order here. Uh, these states also need uh, a combination function. And their combination function uh, has a form like this. It's not a complicated function, uh, but uh, because it will take time, I won't explain it right now. But if you want me to explain, uh, you can ask after the presentation. This is our uh, simulation scenario, sna simulation result of our first scenario. 
in this first scenario, uh, we used Boolean values for context states, as you can uh, as you can see in this next slide. The context states either are either zero or one. Uh, therefore, our combination function selection is done has done in the beginning here. The, the purple one and the uh, black one are the C states, and the uh, selected C state is C2, according to the case. The other part is the classical uh, organizational learning. Uh, these are the phases. This first phase, individual learning. The second phase is the formation of a uh, shared mental model. Here is um, learning from the shared mental model, and his, this fourth one, the last phase, is the improvement of individuals. In the second scenario, uh, we just use non-binary values for context states. Uh, it was binary in the previous one. Here we have value, values like 0 0.9, 0 0.4, 0 0.5 or something. And therefore our mm, combination functions are not uh, zero or one. More than one combination function uh, is selected here. And the software takes the average of them. Therefore, uh, the aggregation of the individuals, uh, the formation of the shared mental model is different here from the first one. The learning levels, levels are different because uh, the different combination functions are used here. Uh, in this third scenario, we again used binary values for context factors. They are still uh, again zero or one, but uh, in this time we changed the context at 400. Uh, with the help of step one's function, uh, we have a context here. We have a case here, but after 400, we changed the we changed our context, as you can see here. Therefore, uh, the combination functions are also changed uh, according to the uh, changing context. And our last scenario is uh, again on the changing context scenario, but uh, for this time we use non-binary values for context states, like in this uh, second scenario. We have uh, non-binary context values, uh, Therefore, our combination functions are different and our learning uh, levels are different, but the idea is the same. Uh, after 400, the context is uh, changed, therefore the combination functions are also changed. Thanks for listening. If you have any questions, you can ask. Uh, if you allow me, I will start with uh, questions. Of course. How your mental models are related to the concept of a mental model introduced by Philip Johnson Laird. Uh, Maybe I can answer this yeah, question. Yeah, please, Not please, this. yeah, go ahead. Yeah, that, that's it. That's <laughs> I'm a glad you can finally clarify all this business. No, but it's good that students answer questions eh, normally. <laughs> But uh, this is a separate branch in uh, literature. Mental models is a very diffuse literature. And part of the literature uh, studies reasoning. And uh, Johnson Laird mostly is in that part. And that means that the mental model is a state, is a static. You, you remember the uh, Lila's uh, overview with different static and, and dynamic? Johnson Laird has static mental models because he has a mental model of a situation that somebody is reasoning about. Oh, I thought he had dynamical systems. Not, no, not, not really like dynamical systems. Well, of I course, just looked up in Wikipedia and I yeah, see yeah, No, but no, it, it, um, he does dynamics with them, but the mental models themselves are static and then he trans has transitions from one mental model to another one and that's the reasoning state. So that's a bit different than a dynamical system where the mental model is the dynamics, where, where the relations are the dynamic relations. That's not in his case. Mm. So that has a bit of difference with the, the type of dynamic models that we use. Okay, thank you. Well, if anybody has questions, I guess others. Sam, Ricardo, who is the else? 
Uh, well, uh, if, if you have time, <laughs> and just a very fast question that is more a kind of a curiosity. Uh, do, do you have a, a software system uh, available for, for, for uh, open source or, or something that uh, we could uh, take a look on, on, on these yeah, uh, experiments? Yes, certainly. Yeah, we have a, a research grade project which has uh, different parts. It has uh, different components of our environment. They are just downloadable there. There is a part where you can find simple exercises to get acquainted with the software. And you can always uh, write an email to me to uh, even have some support in that if you want. I always like to uh, see how things uh, can be done by people with it. Okay. Is it difficult for you to, to put in the chat a, a link to, the, to, to, do, to this uh, tool? No, I can do that. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Well, this, this is the link, Network-Oriented Modeling Software. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks. Please, any other questions? Felix? Maybe, maybe they need some coffee. Uh, yeah, the, well. Hey, I can always come up with one. Um, very, very impressive body of work, uh, just the whole collection of the ideas. So when you're dealing with these systems with lots and lots of feedback loops, you know, you obviously end up with emergent behavior and, and the difficulty is how to engineer uh, a desired result. How, how do you work with us? Well, we saw a little bit in the previous discussion about going and looking at the result of verification kind of step and then trying to modify it. But how do you get a feel for when those systems are kind of spinning into an emergent domain that's unprofitable and how do you control those? Yeah, what, what we in general do is that we are look very well in the literature from a cognitive science or from neuroscience, social neuroscience, where you have uh, much things about mechanisms and, and, and relations, say. That, that's always the basis of our models because we don't let the models come from, an, uh, say, traditional AI perspective like uh, a smart programmer. <laughs> that's the traditional idea of AI, smart programming. We are just not our smartness of the programming is not our source, but the source is in the real literature about humans. So therefore, the models have structures like they have. We can always point at the literature where certain parts of the model come from. There are references always for that. So then another part in the literature tells what type of patterns are expected in certain situations. So that's separate. And we use that as our, our validation options. Even if we, that's often not uh, numerical, uh, many people think validation should always be numerical, but of course the amount of numerical data is very limited, that's available. So in, in many other cases you have qualitative information that's also a form of empirical information that can be used for validation. And if you have a dynamic pattern and you match a dynamic pattern that is described in the literature that it should occur, then you are at least in the right direction. So that's, that's our validation. And as part in the, in the software, one of the software components has also a template where you can do a parameter tuning, where you can have the, uh, say the tuning, what also Timon was uh, showing that he was able to get uh, that uh, stress level down after a while mm -hmm. by just running that software component that uh, uh, you makes use of uh, an optimization within MATLAB uh, based on uh, simulated annealing. But the, our models can just, you can just easily specify in the same style as you specify the model itself also how you do that optimization. Thank and you. For, for the, for the uh, empirical information, also we use the literature, although in most cases not numerical, but qualitative, but still qualitative can be higher or lower, uh, these types of things. And then we 
just express that in numbers like high is 0.8 and low is 0.2, for example. So we still make numbers of them so that the numerical software can handle it. Thank you very much. So this parameter tuning is another potential problem. I do not know what is your use of these mental models, but if you mean them as explanations of the brain phenomena, then uh, it seems like uh, their power is limited because you have so many parameters that you can always fit them to whatever data you get. Yeah, yeah but th that would be the case if I would start with uh, a large number of nodes and all connections between the nodes and then start to adapt them. But that's not what we do. We, we built an architecture that only contains the things that are um, I mentioned in the literature that we have uh, found. So that's our only some connections and some states are there and not a kind of universal uh, machine with all states and all connections. And then you try to uh, move all it until it makes some sense. And that may even be possible, but that's of course computationally very expensive. But what, what we actually do is uh, the, we have the similarity of the structure of the model with the empirical literature. That's one thing. And finally, uh, we say we have an existence proof. Uh, it, it, it's possible to have the pattern generated by the type of mechanisms that are mentioned in the literature. And we don't say that all humans do it in the same way. And I don't think even that's the case. Humans differ a lot. So that's only our uh, simulations are only one case that uh, shows it is possible. And there are many other cases also possible. And the other cases will probably uh, involve the characteristics of other human people or uh, human beings. So therefore, th this uniqueness is not there. It's just one example that you can show. But that also corresponds to the real world where each human being is also one example and another human being is another one. Okay, but is there something that is impossible? Because every hypothesis must be falsifiable if it is a scientific hypothesis, correct? Yeah, suppose that we find in literature somebody claims this and this mechanism explains why this happens. Did you if have we, such examples? Yeah, yeah. If, if, we, if we try these mechanisms and we don't get the, the outcome like they predict, then there is something strange. So maybe we don't do our best enough, but it's also possible that we do our best. We do our best really, and that maybe they're just wrong. So that can be a falsification. That trying the mechanism out, then it turns out that they don't work like that. I think that would be a nice example to show that indeed you can disprove certain hypotheses by this modeling if yeah. they are wrong. Yeah, because, because most of this psychological uh, literature is just a guess. Eh? They, they have in mind, okay, that will develop to certain emergent things, but they don't have the mechanisms really uh, that they try it out. Thank you. Any other questions? Please. To all the five or six previous talks, or how many I am not counting, I guess. No? Well, then... Uh, then we should move on to the... Well, thank you very much. All, all of you, uh, very nice looking people. Uh, thanks for making our conference beautiful <laughs> and uh, also scientifically meaningful. <laughs> Well, uh, we shall proceed with the talk of uh, Matvey. Where is he? Hello, hello, I'm here. Philip, Philip Matvey, okay. Yes. Please uh, introduce yourself and share your screen. Okay.